go ahead and hit record. My clock says noon. So I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, people are still rolling in. Um, but uh, we got a lot to cover today. So let's go ahead. Uh, as always, I'm Patrick Schultz, Extension Forester with Washington State University in Southwest Washington. Uh, here to deliver on another forestry lunch break session. Today, we're talking about waterfowl with Brett Brent Haverkamp, uh, for also from the DNR. We've got a lot of DNR folks this week, um, and we really love our, our partnership with the DNR here at WSU. So just a couple logistics as usual. Um, please set your chat box uh, setting to everyone. I noticed a few people hadn't done that yesterday. Um, this makes sure that everybody can see your questions and also that it gets recorded in the transcript. And please do feel free to type away all your questions during the session. We will get to them at the end. Um, and we'll be, stay beyond 1230 for the Q&A like normal, but it will be recorded. And uh, that session should be uploaded hopefully later this afternoon, but by the very latest uh, next week, unless I have to do some, some sort of editing. But let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn it over to you, Brent, to introduce yourself and get started. All right. You want to you wanna see Brent? Brent, show us your face real quick. All right. We were having some connectivity issues earlier. So. Oh, never mind. All right, sorry, sorry. I didn't know if you. Oh, there he is. Look at so that. We can see him. Put a hey, face in name. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining. I'm Brent Haverkamp. Uh, Going to present the waterfowl lunch webinar. I'm fish and wildlife biologist for the Washington Department of Natural Resources. And I work in the small forest landowners office and assist small forest landowners in Washington State with stream typing wetland delineation. Today I'm going to give you a quick introduction and short biology lesson on North American water. As you can see from this first slide, we have a lot of passion for waterfowl. On the left is a lot of the organizations, departments, and agencies that work to conserve our wetlands and wildlife habitat. They have a great impact on waterfowl populations as well as other wildlife populations and the overall health of our planet. Some of these organizations, tribes, and departments are specific to Washington State, but every state has a form of these groups that work together to conserve wildlife habitat in our country and beyond. Waterfowl are some of the most unique wildlife creatures on our planet as they all migrate to some degree. And most of them visit three or more countries in a single year. And every time they go to a new place, they need good habitat, cover from predators, clean water, and food specifically is very important as they have to have enough energy to get to the next place in their migration, which brings up a fascinating story on waterfowl. The Migratory Bird Treaty signed in 1918 between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. As you can see, their flags represented on the right. This act is extremely important and it holds everyone accountable to provide good habitats to these species at every stop in their migration. And that greatly benefits waterfowl, wildlife, and humanity. So now let's get to it. What are waterfowl? Waterfowl simply are ducks, geese, and swans. And they fall in the bird order Anserformes, which has a total of 178 different species worldwide. Some similar bird orders that we might think of when we think about waterfowl, but fall into different orders. And I'm not going to try to pronounce these orders because I know I'll butcher one of them. And the numbers to the right represent the total number of species in the order. So at the top, we have the shorebirds, pipers, plovers, gulls, and terns. And we have the waders. There's 118 different species of them herons, bitterns, ibis, the rails and, rails and cranes, the grebes loons, and pelicans and cormorants. And this here is a pelican skull that I found in Anahoe Island in Nevada on Pyramid Lake, working with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I believe that chip thing at the top there helps them fish. And now we'll get back into the waterfowl. Washington State has a total of 35 species 
and they are in the Pacific Flyway, which is the area west of the Continental Divide. Bird flyways have been developed by banding birds, and this is when bands are placed on waterfowl species, usually around the leg, when they are molting and can't fly as well in the spring and early summer. The bands have a unique number series that gets recorded, and then someone, usually a hunter, reports the band in the fall or winter during migration. Bands can also be found or read with binoculars on larger birds, such as swans and geese. By plotting the locations where the bands were, where the band was placed on the bird and where the band was re reported or found, scientists noticed four distinct North American flyways, as we can see on the image on the right. You can report bird bands at the United States Geological Survey, USGS, at reportband.gov. You'll get to keep the band and they'll send you a, a letter of appreciation with information about the burn, banded bird, where they banded it, and when they banded it. So it also helps kind of break down the age of different species of waterfowl. So now to break down the different types. First, we have the dabbling ducks, also known as the puddle ducks. And they are often seen in small, shallow waters. If you want, you can ID the duck photos on the right. So I'll quickly go through the species on the left, and they're in no particular order. We'll start with the most common and known duck species in North America, the mallard. It's pictured at the top right with this bright green head, yellow beak, orange feet, and it's blue purple speculum on its wing here, which is also a distinction of the dabbling puddle ducks, as they all have these colorful speculums on their wings. The next duck on the list is the American widgeon, and it is on the bottom right here, taken off of the water. And if you notice, its feet and its wings are kind of vertically lined, which helps them take off flying, as we'll see in the next slide. Next is the Eurasian widgeon, which is just above the American widgeon. And the Eurasian widgeons are occasional visitors to the Pacific Flyway, but there's been no record of breeding in North America. And our next one is the gadwall. And these duck species spend most of their time on water as they prefer aquatic vegetation. The gadwall is pictured in the middle row to the left of the long-legged southern shoveler. And then the male gadwall is pictured in the front here, and the female is dabbling for some food behind the male. The next duck on the list, known for its long tail that can make up a quarter of the male's body, is known as the northern pintail. The pintail was once the most abundant duck in North America. And the next duck on our list, not known for its long tail, but rather its large food shelter that allows them to take water in at the front of their bill and jet it out at the back, filtering the water for vegetation and insects. This duck is known as the Northern shoveler. And you can see the duck with the large bill in the middle of the top. The female is in front and the male is behind. The next three duck species on the list are the teal and the blue winged teal are shown at the bottom left and they are usually the earliest ducks to migrate. The green winged teal pictured just to the right of the blue wings is the smallest of our dabbling ducks. And the cinnamon teal is pictured standing on a log with its cinnamony feathers. These teal are obviously named after their cinnamony taste of their meat, and they are one of the least abundant dabbling ducks as they prefer small, shallow, alkaline waters. And I've never had one, so I cannot vouch for that cinnamony taste of their meat. And more on the dabblers. Why are they called dabblers? Well, they are known for dabbling while they feed tipping up to get food in shallow water, being half in and half out of the water. As you can see, some of the mallards dabbling for food in the photo to the left. Other unique capabilities of the dabbling duck is they're capable of walking and their feet and wings are positioned to basically allow them to jump off the water and off the land. So as you can see here, taken off. And like we could see in this last picture of this widgeon taken off, 
kind of all vertically aligned to just they can jump off the water. Next, we have the diving ducks. First, we'll start with the scops. They can be hard to distinguish from one another and are counted together during aerial surveys. Although the lesser scop makes up a large percentage of the population as they have a much larger breeding range. The lesser scop is pictured in the middle on the bottom and the greater scop is to the right. The ring neck duck is pictured on the top left next to the redhead. Red duck, redhead ducks are known to be parasite nestered to the canvas bag, meaning the female redhead duck will lay their eggs in the canvas back nest. And in the 1980s, the canvas back population suffered from lead poisoning, mostly from ingesting lead shot while feeding on spent shot. And lead shot is now illegal to use for waterfowl hunting, and most populations are recovering. Now we have the rest of the Washington's diving ducks, and they are also known as the sea ducks. First, we have the surf scooter, named for its ability to forage in breaking waves as they can easily dive through a wave crest. The surf scooter is pictured on the bottom far right, and the white wing scooter is pictured next to it on the left. The white wing scooter is the largest of the three North American scooters. And then we have the black scooter, which is the most vocal scooter, and it is pictured at the top on the far right. The long-tailed duck, also a very vocal duck, with a yodeling voice, and they have a complex cycle of plumages throughout the year. And you can see the long-tailed duck on the bottom row with its long, scissory tail. The harlequin duck, shown in the middle on the far left, and harlequin ducks will mate in their second year of their life, and they nest in a variety of locations including small cliffs, tree cavities, and stumps along rocky shores close to the rapids of mountain streams. Next, the golden eyes. The common golden eye is pictured in the middle on the far right and the barrel's golden eyes next to it on the left. Golden eyes are named for their bright yellow iris. Next on the list is one of the most common sea ducks in the Pacific Flyway with an estimated population of over 1 million birds, the bufflehead. Bufflehead is pictured on the top, third from the right. As you can see, the male in the front and the female behind. And the next three species on our list are the fish eaters. They have narrow bills, serrated teeth, and wild looking hairdos. The mergansers. The common merganser is pictured first on the top row and the hooded merganser is next to it on the right. The hooded merganser is the smallest merganser and is only native to North America. The red-breasted merganser is pictured first on the bottom row. And studies show that red-breasted mergansers will eat up to, to 15 to 20 fish a day, and they spend approximately four to five hours foraging for food. So what makes a diver a diver? These ducks are built to swim, dive, and fly. They have large web feet, spend most of their time on large, deep lakes, rivers, and coastal areas. They dive for their food and eat mostly submerged aquatic vegetation, mollusks, crustaceans, and other small fish. Instead of having the ability to jump off the water like the dabbling ducks, divers appear to be running on the water when they take off for flight. The image on the right is a great demonstration for this, and you can also see the canvas back on the left, splashing his big web feet as he takes off. And the big, their big feet also helps them dive down. It can go quite a ways underwater to feed, so it's kind of a unique to the divers. Other unique ducks that we haven't talked about yet are the ruddy duck and the wood duck. Wood ducks are considered dabbling ducks and have most of the same features as the dabblers. However, they are unique as they can perch in trees and they are cavity nesters. The wood duck is shown to the right and the ruddy duck is on the left. The ruddy duck is a small, stiff-tailed duck with a large beak and a short, stout neck. Next, we have our cavity nesters. 
we already talked about these, but to break them down further, we have the wood duck, the buffalo head, the barrows and common golden eyes, and the common and hooded merganser. These birds will use natural cavities in trees as well as constructed nesting boxes. Building nesting boxes can be fun activity and watching from afar in the spring can bring an amazing sight of ducklings leaving the nest and flying through the air for the first time. The photo on the right is a beautiful snag with nesting cavity that was used by golden eyes. And that photo was sent to me by Ken Bevis. Thank you for that, Ken. And the photo on the left was by Greg Thompson of these ducklings flying out of the nesting box they created, which is super cool. That's, I've never seen that photo like that before. It's almost like those ducks are smiling as they're taken off for the first time. So building a nesting box, it's not super challenging and it can be a fun family activity. First things first, be safe. Second, you want to purchase a wood that will hold up in the elements of nature. And for that, cedar is recommended. Also a rough cut of piece, piece of wood will work the best that's untreated. This makes it easier for the ducklings to climb out. But if you don't have a rough cut piece of wood, you can install a piece of hardware cloth or scar the inside of the wood to give the ducklings little toe holes to climb, climb up out of the box. You also want the box deep enough so predators can't simply reach in like a raccoon can't reach in there and grab the hen off of her nest or grab any of the eggs. You can also install a predator guard like you can see on this photo on the little left. This guy's put a sheet metal around the tree. Also, don't put it on the tree super tight and allow that tree to keep growing. And that won't allow predators like raccoons and possums. They can't simply climb up the tree and get into that box. There's also other ways you can do predator guards by kind of making it a piece of sheet metal that wraps around the tree with like a kind of a disc shape that doesn't allow them to basically put a roof on the tree. And the, the entry hole is one of the most critical things is you want it to be about three and a half inches high and four and a half inches wide. That allows the, the ducks to get in and it doesn't allow big predators like a raccoon just to simply jump right in the box. And you can install a finish, but be sure it's a non-toxic and it's an earth tone. You don't want your paint your nesting box super bright to allow predators to see it or paint it black when it gets super hot. It's also, you can fill the box with wood shavings or something, but you kind of want to clean it out each year in the winter. You can hang the box quite high in the tree. It's recommended to get it at least 10 feet off of the ground. And if it's your box is in a spot where you can kind of keep an eye on it, and watch the ducklings leave. After they fledge the nest, you can go in and cover up that hole to keep any unwanted, unwanted pests such as like a European starling or yellow jackets or anything else from taking over your nesting box. Now for the goose species of Washington State. First, we have the Canada goose. There are seven subspecies and the longest known living Canada goose was 33 years old. The Canada goose is pictured on the top left. Next to, next to the Canada goose is the cackling goose. They were once considered a subspecies of the Canada goose, but now they have distinguished them separately and they look like a miniature Canada goose and they have distinctively a high-pitched call where their cackling name comes from. The snow goose are a very abundant species that nest far north in the Arctic tundra. And the snow goose is pictured on the bottom far right. The Ross's goose, which is easily mistakable as a snow goose, but is pictured to the left and they can flying. You can see they have a shorter, stouter neck. And if you look close enough, that snow goose, you can see in between his upper and lower bill, it has a little black, like, Kind of a black line there and the Ross's goose has no no black line. 
Next, we have the white fronted goose, which is also known as a speckled belly. So you can see this lower one, you can kind of see some of the black speckling on its belly. And the white front comes from the large white patch on the front of the head. And then we have the brant, which is another dark goose with an all black head, as you can see from the top photo on the right. And goose species will mainly, they're kind of like dabbling ducks and they also really like going out in grain fields and helping, helping the farmers fertilize their fields. And next we have the biggest waterfowl species, the swans. Identifying the difference between the trump, trumpeter and tundra swan can be difficult. Trumpeters are bigger than the tundras and they lack the yellow eye spot. So if you look closely here on the bottom left of this tundra swan, I tried to help you out by making the fonts color coordinated. You can see that little yellow dot by the eye on the tundra swan and the trumpeter swans are all black. And you can see some of the bands that have been placed on these birds. Science, their populations are pretty low and we're struggling. So they're a very uh, studied bird. And the mute swan on the bottom is easy identifiable by its orange beak. And they are non-native species and they are highly territorial and they eat a lot of aquatic vegetation in a day. So they're not, not great for our native species. So more on the swans. Mute swans, oh, yeah, we already talked, they're invasive and species to North America and extremely territorial. The trumpeter swan is the least abundant swan and fewer than 70 were known to exist in 1932 due to market hunting and habitat loss. They are North America's largest flying bird and the males can weigh up to 25 pounds, making them North America's heaviest flying bird. They also need a long runway to get airborne. And they usually splash their way for 100 meters or so before they take off of the water. And you can kind of see that photo on the left of a big flock of them taking off. Trumpeters also build their nest on muskrat and beaver huts, and they use their webbed feet to incubate the eggs, which is interesting. The tundra swans have a larger population and have a whistle-like call. When Lewis and Clark first wrote about the tundra swans, they referred to them as the whistle swans. And the tundra swans also interestingly will often sleep on the water during winter. And then you can kind of see their breeding range. The trumpeter swan to the left here, a large, I think like 85% of their breeding range is in Alaska. So that's extremely important to maintain those habitats. And then you can see the tundra swan on the right here, its breeding range spans most of the far North Arctic. So it's got quite an extensive breeding range yet compared to the trumpeters. And one thing we can't go without talking about is the duck stamp. The duck stamp started in 1934 and is required for anyone that hunts migratory waterfowl that is 16 years or older. The first duck stamp is pictured in the middle and sold for $1. And now the duck stamp sells for $25. Duck stamps have contributed to over 1 billion in wetland conservation and have been used to obtain 6 million acres of wetland habitat. They've also helped create 300 national wildlife refuges with the funds. The junior duck stamp started in 1989 and was first recognized by Congress in 1994 enacting the Junior Duck Stamp Conservation and Design Program. This conservation education initiative helps teach students from kindergarten through high school about wetlands, waterfowl, and waterfowl conservation. On the bottom here are two Junior Duck Stamps, which is quite impressive. This first one of this canvas back on the right, done by Madison Grimm, South Dakota. She drew that when she was six years old. She also, I think she's won the junior duck stamp three times. And her last one is this one on the left of this green wing teal that was done in 2022, 23. And the first junior duck stamp was done here of this redhead duck. 
super cool that it, all the funds from that kind of go back to help kids learn about waterfowl species and why their habitats are so important to us. And the duck stamp on the top right here was the first duck stamp done by a woman. So I thought that was kind of cool, King Irish. Hey Brent, and, uh, just giving you notice, we've got five minutes. Okay, we're just about there. Perfect. And every year the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service holds an art competition to select next year's duck stamp. And this is the only jeered art competition sponsored by the U.S. government, which is kind of neat. And also buying a duck stamp will give you free admission to any national wildlife refuge that charges a fee. Now for managing for waterfowl, uh, first and best thing you can do is get to know your property. Um, kind of figure out what, what species you have that will help promote waterfowl. A lot of waterfowl, they eat lots and lots of insects and lots of seeds and aquatic vegetation. Uh, top photo on the left here is pondweed. And that's a lot of macro invertebrates and insects and they will eat the pondweed. And then photo to the right here is some smartweed. So if you ever have any of these pink flowering plants along your water on your property, that is smartweed and ducks really like that stuff. And on the bottom here, we have aluminum miner, which is also known as duckweed. And it is a kind of a floating vegetation and the ducks will eat that up like crazy. And there are a lot of resources out there for landowners. So you can contact the Department of Natural Resources and the local conservation districts and your NRCS office can be very helpful as well. So don't be afraid to reach out. And if nothing else, you can always build a, build a nesting box or leave a snag near the water. And if you don't have water or land, but you wanna help, there's still plenty you can do. First thing you can do is buy a duck stamp or better yet, buy two and support wildlife conservation as well as wetland and waterfowl education. Another thing you can do is support a conservation group. At the first slide, we've seen a lot of them, Ducks Unlimited, um, Washington Waterfowl Association, Northwest Swan Association. They all do beneficial projects that support wetlands and other wildlife habitats. And another good simple practice to do is turn your outside lights off during spring and fall migrations, as birds will actually use constellations and large land masses, such as rivers and mountain ranges to guide their migration. And light pollution <clears throat> can cause the birds to get disoriented, delaying their migration and using up extra energy reserves that could be vital to survival and reproduction. And last but not least, Go out and enjoy the majestic creatures and the beauty of nature. We live in a beautiful place, and it would be a disservice to all if we didn't go out and enjoy it. And that's all, folks. And famous words of Daffy Duck. And special thanks to Greg Thompson for the photos and Ken Bevis, Ducks Unlimited, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Duck Snips. And there's my contact information. Uh, you have a any wetland questions, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to take those. Awesome. That's Thank you, it. Brent. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and you finished up before 1230, which is great. I uh, I have to say, I, I didn't know uh, about that turning off the lights thing in spring and fall. And I will definitely try to do that now. Yeah, it's kind of a new, I think that's a new thing that's came out first time i've seen it was just a couple of years ago but it's been they've been pushing it kind of hard so. interesting well we have quite a few questions as usual um so i'll work through those uh give them to you and then of course uh you know ken gary feel free to chime in um the first question we actually got was about beavers and it sounds like ken you're going to take care of that because it's not necessarily on subject for today so i'll let ken talk beavers with you dick um janet asked if there's a link to the recordings of these webinars and yes there is uh, and i imagine 
we'll get another one of those in the chat box as well. Um, that website I sent out to you this morning and uh, in an email, and I'll send it out again tomorrow. There's a link basically to the event page where you signed up for this. Um, and I'm going to be posting the YouTube links on there as well. Ken, sorry, I think I interrupted you. No, you're good. Okay. All right. Uh, so Janet asked, I'm not, maybe Janet, we might need you to clarify, but she says, impact on migration with the death of the Great Salt Lake over the next few years. This is fairly early on, so it may be, may be about, um, I think you talked about swans first. I'm not sure. I, yeah, I would think the cinnamon teal could be affected by that. Would be the first duck species I would consider. I'm not. I'm not real familiar with the Great Salt Lake and the migratory birds that fly in. I think what one thing I've read is that the water levels are dropping. So a lot of the wetlands around the periphery of the Great Salt are basically dewatering. And um, I think a pretty intuitive thing is that it'll be hard on certain waterfowl that have used Great Salt Lake as a major stopover and breeding place, but that's a really gigantic uh, issue related to the presence of these networks of wetlands all the way up and down North America. And Brent alluded to this, but the conservation success of that agreement between the three countries, the migratory uh, stopovers is enormous. And, and waterfowl in general as a conservation issue has been a pretty massive success because of these multi-pronged cooperative efforts, much of it driven by hunters. So that's a long-term thing. And that, I appreciate your pointing that out, uh, Brent, because that's a really significant thing relative to these birds. Yeah, the, without all the conservation efforts from Ducks Unlimited and Duck Stamp and saving all of our wetlands, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of our wetlands were getting because they're easy to fill in and become yeah. farm fields. So a lot, of, a lot of our and, wetlands became farmland. And, and the lead shot thing. So for those who don't know that, uh, and Brent uh, alluded to this with the, you know, he said it with the canvas bags, uh, 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 you know, eating, literally eating shot in the sediments of places where it had been fired out across the marsh. And that was really hard on swans too. Uh, a few years back, and Brent, you probably remember the dates, they actually instituted no more lead shot for waterfowl. And it was a big controversy. People were fighting over it like, oh, no, you're going to ruin duck hunting, blah, blah. Now, no problem. Duck hunters buy non-toxic shot, et cetera. Similar to what should happen with big game with lead and like the golden eagles and the uh, condors and such. Anyway, just that. So the waterfowl conservation cumulative efforts have been entirely remarkable. All yeah. right. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brent. No, I was just going to say it's super cool that, you know, we have, you know, just like the duck stamp, you know, there's not a lot of duck hunters out there that are going to complain about buying that $25 duck stamp because they know it's that benefits <laughs> our population of ducks greatly. Yeah, directly almost. It's, it's a great project. Yeah. So Michael asked uh, regarding wood duck boxes. He says, last year we installed several boxes. Do these require regular maintenance? Do they need to be cleaned out each year? You can. You can clean them out. But one thing to keep in mind is wood ducks won't bring nesting materials into that box. So if you do clean it out, you might want to refill it. And don't put like sawdust. You want to have like wood shavings or something that's not going to you know, accumulate moisture as easy as like a sawdust would. Mm. Yep. Hey, Patrick, I stuck in there uh, a link to the to the wood duck manual that's on the DFW website. Oh, nice. And, and that's down there a little ways. Check that out. That'll answer almost everything you want to know about wood ducks and wood duck boxes. It's really, really a great publication. So I put the little link down there. Uh, and, yeah. and yes. Yeah, you do need to check them every year. And like Brent said, put new wood shavings in, particularly if they've been used. Yep. And covering up, covering them up isn't a bad 
I mean, you don't want to close anybody in, but if you know they're all gone, keeping European starlings and yellow jackets and stuff like that, mm. that is definitely. Yeah. Sometimes wood duck boxes get used by little owls. So, mm. yeah. And so you, you cover them up if you have any issues, like Brent said, with starlings and such. But a lot of times out in the woods, they'll get used by other, by other critters. Yep. Lisa asks, uh, with ducks that eat so many fish per day, is there concern about mercury bioaccumulation in their meat? That's a good question, but I think, yeah. do you think that, I mean, a lot of the fish that they're going to be eating are still super small. They're not big predator fish yet. So the fish, the fish that the mergansers are eating shouldn't have accumulated too much mercury yet in their lifetime, but still could be an issue. I think that's right. Okay. Uh, Ali asked, and can you kind of, I think he answered this. Um, I'm not sure if that was your picture. The with the ducklings that were flying out of the nest box. What kind were they? Can you said bufflehead? I think they're bufflehead, but Brent, maybe you gotta. They're not wood ducks. They're 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 not right for wood ducks. And they're. I don't think they're golden. I think they're bufflehead. I I tried to identify them, so and that's what I can. <laughs> but I wasn't. Sure. I'm not 100 percent sure either. Sure. I wonder how somebody got that picture. That that is amazing. That. Yeah. Had to be a trail cam. Although that box, I got to say, that box has a metal roof, and you don't want to do metal roofs because they overheat. Yep. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. But it is a nice, a nice rough cut piece of wood. So that's yep. in an earth tone. So you want to have an earth. And the snag on the right was up in northeast Washington at Chopaka Lake. There's a pileated woodpecker cavity, and Goldeneye had nested in that. A friend of mine saw the birds. Nice. Yeah. And I was going to ask, Ken, do you know if they were barrows or common Goldeneyes? No, I think they were barrows. I actually think they were barrows. But that's just remembering the story from my friend. So I'm not sure. So you know, that's entirely unreliable from you, Ken, right? <laughs> yeah, but remember, remember, right, 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 Bob. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question here. Uh, what time of year do ducklings typically leave the nest? That is a good... That And ducks will also, if their nest gets predated, they will also try to re-nest. Mm. You can have later ones. But I'm going to say they should be done nesting by May, right? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in general, most of those occurrences are in that springtime range. Right. And it depends on the species, how many days they incubate and when those juveniles would actually be big enough to fly. And then when, they, and when they're done hatching out and everything, they don't, pretty, pretty much most ducks, they don't stay in the nest. They're precocious little rascals. And when they're, they're up and about, they're out of there. And, you know, they, you, like, you think of all the times you'd seen a mallard brood you know, walking across a park or something and they're little ones, they're little yellow guys. And so they're out and about and mom's saying, all right, come hide over here, you know, watch out. And it's a tough life for a baby duck. A lot of them uh, get eaten, killed, die, something happens to them. Yeah. Another interesting thing about ducks, and I had a slide in there, but I had to take it out because I thought I was going to run out of time. But ducks and our upland species, such as grouse, they are invariably hatched. So they, when they come out of the eggs, they have fully covered with down and their eyes are open. So they can start walking and feeding on their own, like Ken said, in a matter of hours or days. Yeah, I bet it, I bet it is hours. I bet it's not very long at all. You know, it is pretty interesting. And they have big broods because the mortality on the juveniles is so high. Everybody's trying to eat them. 
So Elena asks, if you have multiple nesting boxes, uh, and Ken, it looks like you answered this question in the chat, but let's yeah. maybe discuss it more. Uh, I heard it's better to place them far apart so that the ducks can't see each other and have their own territory. Any recommendations on placement for multiple boxes? Ken, you said 100 in the chat and then also pointed to that manual again. So folks definitely right. check out that manual, but any more thoughts on on placement? Can I call out somebody in the in the uh in the thing here, Kit Ellis, I think you're here, Kit, um, has this beautiful lake on her property and there's a, there's wood duck boxes all the way around it and has had consistent wood duck nesting for years and years. And I'm thinking her boxes are somewhere in the order of 75 to 100 yards apart. Kit, are you on here? Can, I don't believe she is today. Oh, she was, she was on yesterday. Yeah. So it was something like that, though. It was pretty interesting. And she had consistent uh, nesting uh, and the and the boxes were put up with a Ducks Unlimited project. So and I got that from the manual. So check out that manual for these detailed questions about uh, wood, wood ducks and uh, their boxes. And as, you, as many of you know, I'm a big fan of boxes because they work. Yeah. So there uh, and Ken, it looks like he answered the next question in there too, but what kind of swans do we see with snow geese in Skagit County? Kind of specific, but maybe that was in reference to a picture? It's it's both. It's definitely both. Yeah. Okay. I think they're mostly tundras just because the tundras are much more numerous, but they'll be side by side. I was up there a couple months, or not months ago, like last year, and it's like, wow, that, and anyway, they're mixed in there together. Yeah. Also on swans, uh, Sheila, you, you may need to specify a little bit, but she says, what about black swans? So maybe if you're referencing something specific, let us know. But uh, any thoughts on black swans? I think I wrote, I think they're a color morph of a mute swan that is um, a uh, domestic, uh, like a domestic mix. So those mute swans are native to Europe and they've been introduced around North America and they've gone feral in places, but the classic is Central Park in New York. And there's the, you know, the elegant swans going over there, are these bloody introduced mute swans that are really hard on native uh, species. But somebody check that. I, I could be talking out my hat right there, but I think they're, they're a, a color morph. So yeah, okay. I could be wrong about that. So we got another question about nesting boxes um, that, but maybe slightly more specific talking about landing surfaces for fledglings is that important at all no i'm pretty sure they can fly out of those things at like 16 feet and be fine yeah, yeah exactly and actually you don't want to perch or something you want the adult to go through because the the little ones they only go out once they climb up they jump and they're they're done so with nest boxes in general you don't need a perch or a platform right i mean imagine like the cavity in the tree that Brent has up there, they fly right up and land on the hole. I always think the notion of cavity nesting ducks is just crazy. It's mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> Wendy asked, uh, in Jefferson County, people hunt ducks and geese in the same agricultural fields where trumpeter swans are foraging and resting. I know it's illegal to shoot swans, but can anything else be done to protect them? I'll let Brent handle that. <laughs> swans swans mixed with waterfowl that are hunted yeah that, that, i I've, I've been a duck hunter for a long time and unfortunately i see i see people well i don't see them shoot swans but i've i've found an <laughs> occasional swan that a waterfowl hunter has mistakenly shot um i would say the best thing to do is hope that there's you know if you can find another wetland or somewhere close by like a national wildlife refuge if they build one of those that doesn't allow hunting kind of gives them a safe safe area to go but as far as keeping hunters away i mean they're gonna they're gonna hunt where they can they're allowed to hunt so and and it's illegal to shoot swans and it's pretty i mean i will say I, i'm a duck hunter too that most duck hunters are pretty conscientious about what what we do and it's it's kind of like the rare vandal that would shoot a swan and and enforcement really the best thing you can do is you know make sure the enforcement officers are out there 
uh, and people, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that as hunting declines in numbers, the ethical, uh, what's the word, behavior of hunters has improved because there's fewer of us, we're getting older and we're becoming more responsible. So the, the, the old stereotype of the bubba that'll shoot anything is receding. And those are the people who would shoot swans. And so the fact that it's not something that people routinely do or brag about, I think almost like social pressure is our greatest thing because the swans are gonna go over to where they feed. And sure enough, you're right, people are out there uh, hunting uh, Canada geese and snow geese. I mean, snow geese are overabundant and actually their numbers are thought to be degrading the, uh, the grasses in the tundra. And so there's pressure to, to reduce snow geese numbers. And uh, how do you do that when they're mixed together? And you, anyway, you do, that's a whole interesting thing. So, yeah. So Sally mentioned that there's a cool website that posts how many birds are in areas during heavy migration so we can uh, turn off our lights when uh, we need to. And then there was a couple of programs mentioned. Lisa mentioned the Fatal Light Awareness Program, uh, which is out of Canada. I checked that website out. I don't think that's what Sally's referring to, but it is interesting. And then Wendy mentioned the Cornell Labs BirdCast has a migration dashboard. And I just checked that out. It looks pretty cool. I'm going to put that ch in the chat. Um, and I think that's what Sally was referring to. So probably worth checking that out. I don't know if you guys know any any other resources but i know cornell is kind of the the peak when it comes to ornithology yeah cornell's super good yeah and they do the the ebird thing i don't know if people are familiar with ebird but that's kind of a way you can look around at what species of birds people are staying in your area and you can yeah. write down what species you find to let people know what you're seeing as well yeah, eBird is a citizen science international database where people contribute their sightings to it, and it goes into this giant database that describes uh, what's the word distribution and movement of species. It's check it out. It's pretty cool. No. Uh, Lisa asked again on the nesting box location, but more specific about the water source. Um, she has a pond nearby that dries up in late summer. Uh, she's wondering if it's still okay to build a nesting box there, if it's still valuable to them. Can you see my head bobbing up and down? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, those, ver those vernal ponds like that can be really valuable and good enough for wood ducks and they'll, they'll have explosions of invertebrate populations and then dry up there it's a really interesting ecosystem and i mean it's worth a try you know frankly because even if you don't get a wood duck you might get a squirrel or a, a screech owl or something yeah. um yeah and one of the one of a really good management tool for wetlands like a lot of people that have constructed wetlands will have a uh a stop log structure box in them so they can actually raise and lower the water level and doing that at certain times a year will actually promote different types of aquatic vegetation such as smart mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. so actually draining your wetland mm -hmm. can be super beneficial to migratory birds why well, brent because it changes the vegetation types that come in yep yep like you can okay. uh there's certain times of the year like i think a lot of the wetlands that i worked on we would kind of lower the water in the middle of the summer and then they will actually promote smart weed growth because you get those moist wet soils instead of being completely saturated okay. yeah lisa lisa's question is a particularly good one for our small forest landowners in washington uh, especially in western washington a lot of people have uh, seasonal wetlands, little seasonal wetlands in the forest or off to the side. Uh, and sure enough, they can be really valuable. Yes. Yeah. Having your wetland go dry is not a not a terrible thing. If it goes dry in the wrong time of year, it can be. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, Sandy asks, is it known how bird flu is affecting these po uh, bird populations, you know, if at all? That, is that I don't know. 
That's a good question, but I do think that waterfowl populations have a high, a higher rate of bird flu. A kind of a, they spread a lot of bird flu is what I've read. I don't know how accurate that is, but since they all kind of like snow geese, they all go back to the same area and there's really large, large flocks of them, it, it can get spread. You know, much like coronavirus, stay six feet away from you one another. <laughs> we got to get masks on all the ducks. Yeah, we got to we got to put little duck footprints in the wetlands. Say like this: be far apart, ducky. <laughs> six wing lengths apart. So, yeah. So isn't it? Isn't the bird the bird flu phenomenon? It's just a couple years old, right? It's basically an emerging issue. Uh, uh, is that not correct? And, well, and I know there's been different out. iterations of it for sure, but the, the most recent outbreak was last summer. Or no, it was early yeah. spring, I think, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so we're going to find out, uh, to Sandy's question, what, that's an emerging situation. We'll see. Here, yeah. have, from, yeah. from what I understand in some of this prior research I've done, um, there most of the the waterfowl populations are more of a vector than they are actually affected by the the flu oh. they don't get affected by it that much but they certainly are a vector oh, interesting. We're talking about brent okay. so we have a, a real unique question in the chat what is the kansas state bird and gary you were right on it uh <laughs> western meadowlark <laughs> and i have to say did you google it or did you just know it is this some, the special no scale it wasn't here? the random factoid that i knew i googled it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you could have lied to us I mean, we would have believed you. Uh, no uh, we're just, just another we're reflection of my intelligence right there <laughs> <laughs> uh courtney asked if i missed it where do we buy the duck stamps post office or you can post get them. office yep you can actually buy them online if you go to yeah. U.S. Yeah. Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service duck stamps. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can buy buy an online version of it. Yeah. And I always I always give my wife one for a Christmas present. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, well I mean, I, I, with duck duck stamps, I have to say the program is set up so that money goes directly to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's a it's a high output per dollar the money doesn't go into the federal budget and get you know allocated hither and yon it goes to u.s fish to my understanding so anyway yeah that's that's how i understand it too ken and a lot of those funds are used to go directly back into wetlands right. whether they're enhancing yeah. them or creating new wetlands and ducks unlimited is like that too uh, they have a really high one reason i support du is they have a really high a dollar to project ratio a lot of their money goes to wetlands projects yep. Yep. nice well it's always good to end with a call to action get out there and buy some duck stamps um, <laughs> and buy buy the junior one too so you can support the <laughs> education initiative oh yeah. we got one more quick question before we wrap up emily asked um do you need a federal duck stamp and a WDFW hunting license for duck and waterfowl hunting? Yes. yes. Yep. That's yep. a yes. Okay. Yep. Good. Yep. Federal well, duck stamp is every throughout the whole United States. You have to oh, have okay. That's federal. You know, and that thing about night lighting, it's not just migratory birds, it's insects. There's all kinds of things that benefit from turning out night lighting um and so that that's that's worth pursuing too so yeah, yeah. good Bats. stuff on that yeah you cut down on your electric bill too so yeah save some money <laughs> win win yeah win -win, yep. all we'll right save. well let's call it there gentlemen uh brent thank you so much you did a great job really appreciate yep, it great um, job, brent. Those of you that are yep. still on, Brent will be back on Friday to talk about songbirds. Uh, tomorrow, Ken's back to talk on excavators. Uh, and I'm sure, Gary, you'll be back, hopefully, to just uh, chime in on the Q&A. Um, yep, sure will. Right Great. Well, okay. thank you all, and thank you to our attendees. Ken, you got a request yeah. to sing tomorrow, just FYI. Okay, Patrick, <laughs> I don't think I will... I'll cue up the woodpecker song, and if we have time, we'll do it in the Q&A. 
Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. All right. Bye, everybody. What? Thank wow. you all. Nice Take work. Care. Good job, Brent.